continues to evolve at a rapid rate. All of us in business, indeed, in all spheres of human activity, live with this daily. In fact, just yesterday, our company Westfield took its first step into online retailing. This is a significant development for a company that for the past 50 years has operated exclusively in bricks and mortar, in the bricks and mortar world of physical shopping centres. These are just some of the reasons we thought it was important to see the view tonight of the head of Australia's leading scientific and technological research organisation. The CSIRO has played a central role in our development as a modern, sophisticated, optimistic economy and society. And I can't mention the CSIRO without tonight acknowledge the presence of Neville Rand. Neville has made a profound contribution to public policy over many years, and he is a regular participant in many of the activities we undertake at the Lowy Institute. But he was also, as I'm sure many of you know, a long-serving chairman of the CSIRO between 1986 and 1991. So as always, Neville, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very lucky this evening to have as our Lowy lecturer, Dr. Megan Clark, the chief executive of the CSIRO. Dr. Clark began her career as a mine geologist and subsequently worked in mineral exploration, mine geology, research and development management, venture capital, and technical strategy for Western mining. More recently, she was vice president for health, safety, environment, community, and sustainability for BHP Billiton. She also served on the expert panel for the review of the National Innovation System. Megan, it's a great pleasure to introduce you this evening, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on science, technology, and Australia's future. Please join us up here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Good evening, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen. I'd, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Frank Lowy in his absence and Stephen and the family and the Lowy Institute for inviting me tonight and really acknowledge the important work that the Institute does in stimulating the discussion around Australia's place uh, in the world. It's an honour and privilege to be here representing CSIRO because it's an organisation that we exist and we really don't rest until our science is being used, until it's being used to create profound impact on the nation's economy uh, and industries, until it's being used to improve the health and well-being of all Australians, until it's being used to create a sustainable environment and future for, uh, for the nation. Tonight I wanted to explore with you three questions. What are the major challenges that face this nation that will require science and innovation? What are the new opportunities emerging for Australia that will come about because of changes in science and innovation? And lastly, what would we need to do differently to make sure that we remain globally relevant in an area, as Stephen outlined, that is changing so fast and countries around the world are investing significantly in their R&D capacity. Just to set the scene, I wanted to share with you some work of some of our scientists who are actually here um, tonight. Well, we've been looking at the trends and the way that we will live in the future and how science is changing and responding to some of those trends. So these trends are just are really going to affect the way, uh, the way we operate. Stephen Chu, who's the US Secretary of Energy, when he was talking about climate change, said, for the first time in history, science is making predictions on how our actions will affect how we live 50 to 100 years from now. And in this future, we are all connected. The significant pressures that we have on global systems, such as our population growth, such as urbanisation, are really bringing challenges, global challenges, to securing our food, securing our water, securing our energy for the future. 
But these challenges cannot be dealt with in isolation. They are connected and we must learn to look at them in a connected way. At CSIRO, we already invest over a third of our investment in working on these complex connected challenges. We've organised ourselves in 10 national flagships to address the major challenges and opportunities that face the nation. And what it means for us is it means we're going to tighten our focus on much more on these top challenges and opportunities that face the nation. We're also going to build national pictures of the systems that connect them. It means an even deeper commitment by our scientists um, and working with their partners to work in multidisciplinary teams, to work together across and between all of the disciplines. So it's a fundamental commitment to change the way we actually work. In defining these future challenges, 50 of our leading scientists got together and then talked through with 120 leaders in the nation from all spheres. And they concluded that the most significant trend that would affect us in the future was that we would need to deliver more from less resources to more people. More from less to more people. And as a nation that exports energy, exports minerals and exports food, we absolutely understand how this trend that's operating globally has helped position Australia. But we are also going to see powerful new markets emerging that will drive us to much more resource efficiency, clean technology. We'll see waste as a source of opportunity and we'll see nature as a, as a source of inspiration to us. For the first time, we'll put measurable value on things that we've just taken for granted. Water, our own biodiversity, we're one of the most biodiverse nations and we, we take it for granted. This is not a distant future at all. And uh, we're already seeing science and markets interacting more closely than they have ever done before. The second mega trend we're seeing is, uh, is a divergence in our demographics. In the OECD countries, we're seeing ageing, lifestyle, diet-related health issues, chronic disease becoming the most likely cause of how you will die. And in the developing regions and countries, we're seeing higher fertility rates and not enough food for millions. So on one hand, it's going to drive increasing investment in preventative health, personalised health care, and on the other hand, an increase in global trade of the most basic food commodities of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. In our, in our world, we often think of uh, a fat as the thing that should be avoided. If you are searching for enough calories to survive, it is an absolutely wonderful commodity. And that will be supplied mostly as cereals, meat, and milk products. So we will see these divergent demographics play out in completely new markets for us and the, and the growth of some of those markets. Around the world, as a species, we are undertaking the greatest migration we have ever undertaken as a, uh, as a species. And that is we're moving from our rural environments to urban cities. We're changing jobs, we're changing careers, we're changing houses more than we've ever done before. We're commuting further to work than we have ever done before. Even through the global financial crisis, we saw 8% year-on-year growth of airline travel, and China is building 97 new airports. And just watch out for the growth of rapid trains and high-speed trains linking, linking us and, uh, and linking China through, uh, through to Europe. In this future world, and Michael and I were just talking about uh, his kids entering this future world, we'll be more connected and we'll be more virtual. It really will be an I world. Computing power and memory storage are still improving rapidly and they are having a deep effect on the way we're doing science. They're also having a deep effect on the growth and benefit that we can extract from, uh, from science. They're underpinning advances in genetics and we now know it's different from when I went to school, that we have the genetics we're born with, but we also, our genetics can change with time in response to, uh, to the environment around us and response to the food we eat, in response